Hey, Modern Minds listener, this episode is going to be dealing with medication, and there's two physicians on the show. So given that, this is a reminder up front that Modern Minds is about education and awareness. It's about discussion and debate on modern issues in mental health care. Nothing that you hear today should be understood as medical advice. If you're considering adding, changing, or stopping any medication, please discuss it with your health care provider. Thank you. I'm Mark Hennick. Today I'm going to be talking about deprescribing with Dr. Mark Horowitz and Dr. Christy Huff. For the Hartford Healthcare Behavioral Health Network, this is Modern Minds. Welcome to Modern Minds, I'm Mark Hennick. Today on the show, we're talking about deprescribing in mental health care. For some, medications can play a crucial role in managing a variety of mental health conditions and in improving their quality of life. However, as our understanding of these medications advances, so too does our knowledge of the potential harms and risks associated with certain drugs. Today, we're going to be delving into the art and the science of deprescribing. This is the process of thoughtfully reducing or discontinuing medications that might no longer be necessary. They might even be causing harm. Joining us today are two brilliant minds who have been at the forefront of this movement. First, we have Dr. Mark Horowitz. He's a renowned training psychiatrist and a leading expert in deprescribing practices. I'm also going to speak with Dr. Christy Huff. She's a cardiologist and a passionate patient advocate. Dr. Huff has witnessed firsthand the impact of overprescribing and the importance of empowering patients to take control of their healthcare decisions. She brings, I think, a unique perspective to our discussion today, shedding light on the patient experience in the deprescribing process. So let's jump right in. Here's my conversation with Dr. Mark Horowitz. Thank you so much for joining me on Modern Minds today, Dr. Horowitz. Thanks for having me on here. Great to speak to you. So we're talking about deprescribing in, and specifically in psychiatry and mental health. I'm going to get you to unpack that for us as we go along. But first, I want to think about just how things are right now. You know, deprescribing assumes prescribing. Antidepressants are among the most widely prescribed medications in the world, as are other agents in this in in this space. So, what's your perception right now on uh, on treatment as usual? How do, how does treatment of mental illness usually go? Um. You know, mental illness is obviously a very wide um, category that stretches from uh, common anxiety and depression all the way to what you see as more serious mental illness like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Uh, in general, the treatment of all mental health conditions is currently very medicalized, which is uh, it's a process of fitting someone's symptoms to a diagnosis and then giving them the appropriate medications. Of course, therapy and other non-medication treatments are given alongside that, but it's but it's become predominantly a medicalized field, a field where medications are used primarily. Um, when you understand, that, for example, anxiety and depression occurs in about 70% of people in their up until the age of 45, it's a very common condition. And so rather than seeing it as a medical illness that requires specific medication, uh, it might be better seen as a as a fairly normal part of people's lives and treated in a less medicalized way. But, but that aside, it is now treated uh, in a highly medicalized way. In in the US, one in four people are on an antidepressant. About one in six or seven are on a benzodiazepine or sleeping tablet. Uh, in in uh, Europe and in England. One in four people are on some sort of psychiatric medication. So, psychiatric medications are now prescribed very widely, and they're increasing every year. Mm. Now, that biomedical model of mental illness—it's as you mentioned, certainly the prevailing one in America and elsewhere. It's this materialist or physical physicalist view that problems of the mind are problems of the body. It kind of collapses the difference between them. And and I think it's probably this this determinism too, maybe not to get too philosophical, that problems can and should be defined and fixed. So 
Um, I'd like to challenge you maybe a little bit, but do you think there's any benefits uh, of that medical lens on mental illness? I, we'll get to the drawbacks, but do you think that there's been any benefits? Look, it's, it's a huge area of, of debate. I mean, I'm not suggesting dualism or that the mind and the brain have nothing to do with one another. I think it's, it's, a, it's a sort of truism to say that everything that happens in the mind occurs in the brain. Um, I, I guess the, the contention in the field is, is that the best level at which to understand things? So, uh, you know, one approach to understanding depressed mood would be to look in the brain at what part of the brain is more active during uh, depressed mood. Uh, and that is where a lot of money has been put to look at what are the neural basis of, of, of depressed mood. Uh, another way to think about it would be what are the circumstances in someone's life that have led them to be uh, hopeless, uh, demoralized, or suicidal. And that is a very different approach. Uh, you know, to some degree, uh, all approaches uh, may have some validity, but the last 50 years of research uh, in, in the field of anxiety and depression has produced no concrete findings that have helped us to forward how we treat anxiety and depression. Um, and so, one perspective would be that we're looking in the wrong place. An analogy, hackneyed as it might be, uh, could be that in trying to fix a software issue, we're looking at the hardware. So that if someone has an issue with Microsoft Word, if someone came along and opened up the back of your computer to start solving the circuits, you might think that was a bit peculiar. But that is currently what we're doing in the, in, in the field of psychiatry. I think we're mm -hmm. mistaking things in people's minds and in their lives or what is going on. So, I mean, beyond the sort of academic debate there, what are the real world implications or drawbacks, do you think, uh, as it affects people who are suffering and the patients of, of that kind of model? So I think it can be unnecessarily pathologizing, and I think it can be stigmatizing, and I think it can lead to worse outcomes. So it's often said that giving people biological explanations of what's going on with their emotions is is destigmatizing. That if you tell people there's something wrong with their brain, it's not their fault. That you're making uh, life easier for them. But there's a, there's another side to that because if you tell somebody that the reason why they're feeling demoralized, hopeless, or suicidal is because there's something wrong with their brain uh, that we haven't quite worked out yet, but but research you know may one day work it out. You're telling them that they essentially have a broken brain of some sort. It is it is often experienced as a relief in the short term diagnoses, and in the long term it can become a sort of self fulfilling prophecy because people are less inclined to rely on themselves, or less inclined to think they can make changes that will affect uh, their health because they're told that there is something organically wrong with them, and that implies that medical interventions are the most sensible uh, thing. So. I think that uh, telling people that they've got a condition like major depressive disorder or generalized anxiety disorder, rather than explaining to them that they're demoralized because uh, various social relationships in their life are unfulfilling or they're under certain stresses, can in the long term lead to worse outcomes and people internalizing uh, a negative and broken uh, image of themselves. That's the all the time clinical practice. Now, I mean, billions of dollars of research have been spent, especially, and it seems like it's increasing uh, in recent years, uh, has been spent on on basic research in the physiology and the neuroscience of mental illness, as well as in the social sciences and, and on social determinants of mental health. But I heard you say just a, just a minute ago that we haven't made a whole lot of headway. Uh, we haven't produced a lot from that research. Can you talk more about that? So... You don't need to take my word for it. You you could take the word of Thomas Insel, who was the, the head of the National Institute for Mental Health Research in America, who said that after spending tens of billions of dollars on research into mental illness, they hadn't moved the dial at all in helping patients. They, in his words, had produced some cool science on genetics and imaging, but nothing that a, nothing of practical um significance to patients on the ground. And I think that is, in general, the sum total of the neuroscience research that's occurred for the last few decades. It hasn't had any practical um, improvement in, in, in the lives of people suffering from conditions. And I think that comes down to that 
what I would see as a as a fundamental category error, mistaking issues in the mind and people's lives for issues in their brains. There's a there's an incredibly clear relationship between stresses on people's lives, uh, poverty, uh, relationship discord, uh, physical illness, and the rates of depression and anxiety. So it is very clear from research that it's conditions in people's lives that lead to feeling depressed and demoralized and suicidal. And I think it makes the most sense to do with those conditions, hard as that might be, rather than looking further for some order of the brain that we can tweak uh, with a medication or with electricity but to fix um, issues in people's lives. Mm. I've, you know, there's been such a... Uh, an increase in mental health awareness and campaigns, celebrities, you know, governments are talking. Just in the last probably ten years or so, uh, mental health has reached sort of a, a bubble of sorts in terms of awareness. But I've also noticed that there's a certain central dogma of so many of these campaigns and conversations, which comes back to what we're talking about: that uh, the idea that mental illnesses are brain illnesses, that depression is just like cancer, uh, that collapsing of the difference. And I, I think the goal is probably a, a noble one: it's it's to lend legitimacy to mental health by by hitching it to something that's seen as more legitimate, physical health. Um, is that particularly helpful, though, or or could that be? Um, harming people who are struggling to try to to reduce it that way. I agree with you. I think a lot of this comes from uh, probably good intentions that it will uh, you know lead to less stigma for patients if you tell them it's it's a, it's a brain condition. It's not their fault. Uh, I also think it stems a bit from the interests of drug companies who, in convincing uh, us that we have neurochemical problems, makes us. Uh, more likely to become customers for neurochemical solutions. Um, I think that you know it can be damaging for people to be told that the very common, often very understandable emotions that they experience are actually illnesses. Because you know, one thing it teaches us is to be afraid of our emotions. Um, you know, uh, as I as I said earlier on, actually. By the age of 45, 86% of people will meet criteria for mental illness. 70% of people will meet criteria for anxiety and depressive uh, conditions. So these are very common um, conditions in life. You know, when we are overwhelmed by demands in life, we become depressed. When we feel very insecure about the future, we become anxious. So uh, these are very common conditions. Uh, I just think of a, a report. In, in England at the end of last year saying that there was um, a spike in uh, mental health conditions amongst young people and it was associated with poverty and bullying. And the response to that was for there to be more research into what is causing mental illness and how we can best treat it, which I sort of think of as a an absurd response mm. um, you know, that can exist in a, in, a, in a society that's sort of been seized by neuromania where the brain and technology you know, offers so much promised understanding of these things, because obviously uh, you would respond to that by saying poverty and bullying are causing people to become depressed and need to address bullying. Not to turn to understanding the brains of people who are depressed in those circumstances. You know, we would all become depressed uh, in circumstances of uh, oppression. Uh, and so I think that there has been this reductive focus on the brain and I look to technology for explaining what is going on uh, has turned us away from the more intuitive, obvious, humanistic explanations for what is going on. And I think it has distracted us uh, mm. from what the real solution is. And, and re redirecting resources as well, right? I mean, if you're if there's a bullying problem and as 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 we know, hard things are hard. Hard things are supposed to be hard. Of course, you would react in an in an adaptive way to that. So then, to uh, fund something that isn't focused on the core problem seems like a misdirection of of resources. I, I agree. There's been a huge expenditure uh, in the Western world into you know research on genetics and neuroscience to to make sense of psychiatry, and it's all very interesting. And I've did my PhD in that in that topic and understand why people are so fascinated by it as I was, because there's this promise that we could understand what is under the hood and causing uh, emotional problems. It's very appealing, um, but I think that we have spent large amounts of money that hasn't returned any of the people on the ground. So 
sometimes I've had people say to me that it's utopic to think about solving issues like poverty and bullying, which are, are widespread. Um, but I think unless we are honest about what is causing the problems that we're experiencing, we have no hope of solving them. So it may well be that equality and bullying are very difficult issues to, to manage. But if we pretend that the issues exist in the amygdala and hippocampus and not in schools and now societies, then I think we are being directed towards uh, you know, solutions that are not, not really the ones that are gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna have the most benefit. Mm. Let's do, let's drill back to uh, the medication piece specifically, because I, I imagine people who are listening or watching might be thinking, well, what does this have to do with with the prescribing? But I think it's important um, background cultural context of how why somebody would want to deprescribe in the first place and how we got to the place where uh, maybe they're they're prescribed. So um, let's talk a little bit first about the efficacy of medications in in psychiatry in general. It seems like we have more antidepressant prescriptions, for example, than ever before. But people are also more depressed than ever before. The numbers seem to be going up, not down. Can you help us make sense of that? Yeah, so it's a great point. So, so when you think about deprescribing, so one, you've got it on the background of what I've just outlined, which is several decades where the medical model of mental health conditions has been predominant. It's led to widespread prescribing. Many people would argue gross overprescribing, where now one in four or more people in Western countries are on a psychiatric drug. And so deprescribing, which didn't come from psychiatry in the first place, it came actually from uh, geriatric medicine, is the idea of rationalizing overprescribing because medications can, in some cases, cause more harm than good. And deprescribing is simplifying people's medication regimes in order to address those harms. When it comes to antidepressants in particular, you've made a very astute observation that other people have also made, which is if antidepressants were very effective for anxiety and depression, then how come we have rising rates of anxiety and depression? When uh, an effective drug like insulin was introduced into medical practice, amputation of diabetic limbs went down. It would be very peculiar if alongside the introduction of an effective medication, uh, amputations of, of diabetic limbs went up. And so you're right to ask the question, are these drugs uh, effective. And the, the science on this issue is, is, in my view, quite clear. There have been about a thousand studies on antidepressant effectiveness where they compare an antidepressant to a sugar tablet. Uh, in these studies, they show that antidepressants are better than sugar tablets by about two points on a 52-point depression scale, a very, very small difference. There are a few reasons why even that difference is probably exaggerated. People who are given antidepressants are unblinded in these studies. They know that they're on a medication because of the side effects. When people know they're on a medication, it leads to expectation effects that they'll get better. And that may uh, make people on medication uh, show improvements that are not due to the medication, but due to their, their thoughts about the medication. The studies are extremely short term. 97% uh, of these studies are conducted by the drug companies that are, are selling the drugs. Uh, they go for normally six to 12 weeks. Uh, we know that people in America, most of them on antidepressants are taking them for more than five years. In England and Europe, it's more than two years. We know that medications tend to wear off over time, what's called tolerance. And so these small effects, if they are real at six weeks, are very likely to wear off over time. We know that's very true, particularly for drugs that cause withdrawal symptoms. And antidepressants are becoming uh, increasingly recognized to be cause withdrawal symptoms in lots of people. Um, uh, there's also an issue with publication bias when it comes to antidepressants. We know that most trials are not published. All companies are not compelled to publish all the trials that they've conducted. Uh, when you look at trials uh, that haven't been published, most of them are negative. That is, they show no difference between sugar pills and antidepressants. So there's a wide variety of reasons to think that antidepressants are not very effective. And even the biggest booster of antidepressants will admit that they have small effects. But there's a right, there's now an increasing group of psychiatrists and researchers who think they, they have no significant difference from, uh, antidep uh, from, from sugar tablets in terms of having a clinically important difference. So, you know, that's, that's one concept probably to get across, which is 
For example, if you show that a diet pill is better than uh, a placebo, but it only causes you to lose 50 grams of weight, it's not thought to be a clinically important difference. And that is probably true for antidepressants uh, before we get into the whole host of side effects or adverse effects that the drugs can cause. Well, I mean, you mentioned that that there's there's more than a thousand studies. You talked about how underwhelming the evidence is, uh, uh, the methodological issue, certainly. But you know, if if you, this is never a good guide, but if you turn to the conversation on social media, uh, it seems like there's still a stigma uh, against leveling this kind of legitimate scientific criticism uh, against the medical model, against treatment as usual. You know, you get accused of being anti-psychiatrist or a, a Scientologist or even anti-science. You get accused of pill shaming, all this stuff. What do you make of that social aspect uh, of this conversation? Why does that happen if the evidence is seemingly so clear? Um, you, you, you're, you're right. Uh, discussion about psychiatric medications becomes very very emotive, very quickly. It's very hard to have a, a rational discussion about it. Um, I think this is this is for, for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, number one, uh, you know, started with with uh, drug companies and their, the academics that work with them in trying to discredit critics of their products. They would use this slur of being a, a Scientologist or an anti psychiatrist which is a way to distract from a discussion of the benefits and harms medications, which is a completely normal part of medical and scientific work. That's what, that's what doctors and medical researchers do in every uh, specialty of medicine. Is this, is this treatment more harmful or more beneficial than, than another treatment? Um, it's, a, it's a way of silencing critics. Uh, it used to be done. It, it, it's very reminiscent of what has been done in the climate change space where uh, people who would point out the effects of fossil fuels on climate change, you know, used to be dismissed as communists uh, or, or, or anti-corporate actors, rather than considering the scientific facts they were putting forward. Uh, it's a similar kind of approach taken by drug companies and their supporters. It's also become mixed up in identity politics, where many people have been told they have a mental illness. They've incorporated that into their identity. I understand that very well because I've, I've been exactly in that position. I've done the same thing. Uh, you know, it, it's a way that people make sense of their lives and, and make sense of the stress they've been through. And criticizing medication is tied into uh, criticizing the legitimacy of people's suffering, which I think is a very false connection. It's been called the, the false brain or blame dichotomy. If you're criticizing the effectiveness of medication, you're, you're thought to be criticizing the the uh, the, the reality of people's uh, mental health condition and therefore blaming them for uh, being weak or, or, or something else uh, discriminatory. Well, I would argue that that's not really what's happening here. Now, I, I think people respond to oppression and stress in their environments in an understandable way that, that requires support and, and merits uh, instance and criticizing Medication, looking at its arms uh, and its benefits, you know, is not an ideological process uh, seeking to, um, you know, to, to 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 stigmatize people, but doing something that's a very core part of being a doctor or a scientist, which is looking at the evidence on either side. And it's very unfortunate; it's become so emotive a topic, and people cannot uh, discuss it, work out what is best for people. We're going to have much more with Dr. Mark Horowitz in just a few minutes, including on a, a protocol for how to de-prescribe. But first, I want to break away because I want you to hear from Dr. Christy Huff. Dr. Huff is a doctor and a patient, and she's been a thought leader in the mindful prescribing and de-prescribing of benzodiazepines. So here's my conversation with Dr. Huff on Modern Minds. Christy, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. So we're talking on this episode uh, episode about the idea of de-prescribing, and what I'm interested about um, your background and your history is that, like I mentioned, you're a, you're a cardiologist. You're focusing on benzodiazepines. Uh, that for me isn't an immediately apparent connection. You know, usually that that's a conversation that's had in psychiatry or or psychology. So can you tell me a bit about, a bit more about your background, your interest uh, as a cardiologist and as just a person uh, in benzodiazepines in particular? 
Sure. So actually, I have lived experience with benzodiazepines. I was prescribed them um, to deal with a health crisis I was experiencing back in 2015. And um, I became physically dependent pretty quickly on them, even though I didn't take more than prescribed. And I took it took me over three years to taper off the medication. And it proved to be extremely difficult. And even, um, you know, four years later, after completely being free of the benzodiazepine, I am, um, you know, still suffering some protracted symptoms. And so during that whole experience, it just led me to realize how little training we as physicians receive on um, these medications and as specifically how difficult they can be to come off of and how to properly de-prescribe them. And mm -hmm. so that's, and I started talking to other patients um, that were experiencing the same thing. And that's how I became involved in this advocacy. Mm, and I'm sure uh, you've heard that it's quite common. Now, um, you know, we have a lot of physicians who who watch and listen to this show, but uh, for either, if they're either not involved in, in benzo prescribing or uh, for other uh, people who are listening who might not know exactly what these compounds are, can you tell us a little bit more about what the benzodiazepines are? Um, what are the indications, the contraindications? How are these employed in clinical settings? Yeah, so benzodiazepines um, are considered to be sedatives or minor tranquilizers. They go through or go by such familiar names as like Xanax or Valium. And they're often, most often prescribed for things like anxiety and insomnia. They um, work to, um, they bind the GABA receptor and they enhance the activity of GABA, which is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in the um, nervous system. So I'm curious then about um, the safe prescribing of that. I know you had an adverse reaction, but you know, do, do you think that there is a role for for uh, benzodiazepine prescribing? Yeah, the, I mean, there definitely is. They are meant to be for short term use. That's what most of the guidelines say. And um, if you look at the FDA prescribing information, they say the best way to use them is the shortest um, duration possible at the lowest dose. So really just try to minimize that use and only use um, as needed. It's always good to um, look for, you know, alternatives, but they, they are very useful in things like they're used in emergency setting to abort an acute seizure. They're used for um, alcohol withdrawal to prevent a seizure. They may be used to taper off of a benzodiazepine. So there's definitely um, uses for them mm -hmm. in clinical mm -hmm. But it sounds like not a not a set. I mean, not many medications are a set it and forget it kind of thing. But it's not supposed to be a, a chronic um, treatment or a, an ongoing treatment. It sounds like right. Long term use is generally not recommended because there there are adverse effects, and then their efficacy tends to wane over time. Oh, interesting. Okay, so what are some of those adverse effects that either you experienced or that you've heard of others experiencing? Yeah. So obviously, uh, physical dependence is going to be a big one. So basically, the brain and body adapt to being on the medication. And then once you stop it, um, you get withdrawal symptoms. And um, in addition, I mean, they can be sedating, they can cause dizziness, they've been associated with increased accidents, fractures and falls and things like that. So how, then how can we better educate um, physicians who very often are having, I think anyway, patients come to them because they've seen a television commercial, for example, for, uh, for a, a medication that ends up being a benzodiazepine. Uh, and that person comes in asking for it. Maybe they're experiencing acute anxiety. It's really interfering with their life. You know, it seems like an entirely reasonable request to go to your doctor and ask for help with that. Um, so then how can we better educate uh, physicians on alternative treatments or at least appropriate use of these medications? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, first of all, most of the benzodiazepines are generic at this point. So you're probably not going to see a um, television commercial for them nowadays just because it's not lucrative, I guess, for the drug companies at this point since they're mostly generic. But patients do often come in and ask their doctor for these things because they've been around for years. I mean, and they're very well ingrained in popular culture. It's like, oh, just you watch a movie and they're like, oh, just pop a Xanax. Like it's no big deal. And so the education piece is something that we have really been working on at my organization. And, um, you know, I've been presenting a lot recently at different medical conferences and um, 
We're working with this group out of Colorado. And then we produce some guidance documents for um, the prescribing. And then also um, several members of our organization are on a patient panel um, sharing our lived experience with the American Society of Addiction Medicine. And they're working on it under a grant from the FDA to um, to generate some B prescribing guidelines for benzodiazepines. And that's, that's a couple of years out, but that's an exciting project. Mm. I've heard more than once, particularly with benzodiazepines, that um, you can do a great job of educating, you know, say that person's family doctor or whoever their primary caregiver, primary physician is. Um, but since they can be habit forming, uh, that patient might just go to a different doctor. Uh, have there been any strategies uh, to address that issue of double doctoring of of dependency that can arise with the use of these kinds of medications? Yeah, that's a good question. I think most states have implemented something called the PDMP or prescription moderating database. Um, and so physicians are able to log in and check and uh, see exactly what prescriptions patients are filling that are also controlled substances. So that's a way of, you know, preventing that doctor shopping basically. Mm. Um, it's also not uncommon, particularly in psychiatry. Uh, I experienced this myself as a person with lived experience to be prescribed many different things at once. Uh, and it seems like this is just anecdotal, but it seems like benzodiazepines are often, you know, a, a, a part of that cocktail uh, of medications along with antidepressants, sometimes antipsychotics and a number of things. Um, what are the kinds of drug interactions that we might look for uh, uh, with benzodiazepines in particular, uh, either working complementing or, or, or I suspect uh, working against other drugs that somebody might be prescribed? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, they're very notable for interacting with opioids. And in fact, the mm. FDA came out with a box warning back in 2016, cautioning against that, um, combination because anytime you combine two things that cause respiratory depression um, that can lead to overdose and even death so it's also dangerous to combine um, benzodiazepines actually with any other sedating um, medication or like alcohol and and things like that that's fascinating the piece about about opioids because you know since we've heard certainly many times that we're in a an opioid crisis right now it seems uh, depending on who you ask uh, particularly with overdoses so that's not something that that I was um, that I was aware of um, now I know that you know you've practiced cardiology and this is maybe more of a of a psychology psychotherapy type question but um, anxiety disorders. Uh, seem to be best treated through psychotherapy, through relearning how to um, encounter uh, or, or regulate uh, your response to the to the world around you, even in cases of trauma and PTSD. Uh, and I've heard it said uh, that sometimes um, medications which reduce that anxiety almost artificially, like benzodiazepines or sedatives can do, actually can get in the way of treating the underlying cause, that you're not learning anything, that you're treating the symptom uh, and not the core cause of what's making you feel that way to begin with. Um, how does that fit with your understanding of uh, why benzos might be prescribed and, and how we can perhaps treat the underlying cause better? Yeah, that's um, definitely true. Um, again, they're mainly effective in the short term. And then over time, you can get tolerance. And actually, people can end up with worsening anxiety. We call it benzodiazepine-induced hyperanxiogenesis, which is kind of a mouthful. But um, people can in actually end up with worse anxiety than before they even started the benzodiazepine. So that's that's something to caution. I mean, I think they're probably best used um, maybe just like kind of a one-off dose to prevent a pan panic attack, maybe somebody who has fear of flying, something like that. And um or sometimes they're used as a um, kind of a bridge to therapy. So if somebody's in an acute crisis and you're just giving it to them short term before you um, before they um, get psychotherapy or counseling and these other um, um, modalities that can be effective. Mm. Part of, um, I think, this whole mix is the, the role of patient self-advocacy of people speaking up when they're experiencing adverse effects and or something just doesn't feel right um and you know 
if I'm off base here, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you've been uh, maybe a very effective self-advocate because you have an MD after your name too, right? You know what you're talking about. Yeah, this isn't your first rodeo. For other patients, I'm not sure that's always the case. You know, you we, we've heard many times they sit in front of their doctor, they tell them that the medication is, makes them feel awful, uh, and then the doctor either doesn't do anything or kind of dismisses that concern, um, places themselves uh, as more experienced and more knowledgeable. So what are your recommendations for people in being effective self-advocates if they're on benzos or anything else and want to talk to their doctor about whether or not it's it's working for them? Yeah, that's a good question. And actually, even as a physician, I still ran into a lot of pushback when I started having problems. So I I can imagine that um, patients without a medical education, it would be even, even worse because I experienced that disbelief and lack of validation. Um, but I would recommend that people do their research before coming to the doctor and just get educated about this issue. Like I printed out a copy of the Ashton manual to um, take to my doctor. And it, I went through a couple of different doctors before I was found somebody that was willing to work with me. And then really, it's just about finding that physician that's going to be willing to take a patient centered approach and validate what you're experiencing. And sometimes that's kind of a trial and error process. Mm. Now, the last piece of this, of course, if you do you and your doctor together, because I assume you're going to, well, actually, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't make any assumptions here, but uh, I suppose it's wise to talk to your doctor and not just do it yourself, right? This isn't a DIY job to de-prescribe, is it? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a good question because we do have patients in the online support communities who are, <laughs> are doing the DIY thing just out of necessity because they've sure. had trouble finding a doctor that's willing to work with them. But yes, in the ideal world, you would have a doctor who's patient centered and willing to learn about this issue. And then the patient is working with them and, you know, letting them know, you know, exactly what's um, going on symptom wise. But um, again, that's in an ideal world. And that's not always what happens. I, I was lucky to be able to find a physician that was willing to work with me. And he just sort of let me, um, you know, do what I needed as far as tapering. So you've mentioned tapering a number of times. Uh, I imagine that involves pharmacists as well, beyond just the physician. So can you tell me a little bit more um, about how to taper, what that looks like, how what what typically works in that in that process of coming off benzodiazepines? Yeah, that's so. That's a good question. Um, tapers um, are definitely going to be and are definitely should be individualized. Um, to the patient and the symptoms that they're experiencing. So a subset of patients are going to be able to um, taper off fairly rapidly, while others of us, like what I experienced, it was very difficult. We have to make very um, tiny reductions. I think the Ashton manual is probably a good starting point. Um, Heather Ashton was a British psychopharmacologist, and, and she ran a withdrawal clinic for benzodiazepines in the 80s and 90s. And she wrote this manual, which has basically a summary of her clinical experience and helping these patients coming off the medications. And there's protocols for coming off um, the various benzodiazepines. She generally recommends you switch over to the Valium because it's longer half-life. And because, and because of its lower potency, you're able to get smaller reductions. And, um, but even with that being said, her protocol is considered to be fairly slow, but I had to go even slower. And I ended up using a technique about halfway through my taper called um, micro taper, where I was making these very tiny reductions um, using a scale. And I was able to, you know, make my withdrawal symptoms uh, more tolerable that way. But, you know, again, this is going to be a very individualized process. And I think that's it's best if it's patient led. So the patient is deciding um, when to make the reductions and, you know, how much based on the symptoms they're experiencing. Yeah. And certainly I think it, it reinforces uh, the need for patients that, that you, you need to take this slow and uh, that you'll get there, uh, but not to, not to do it too quickly. Well, thank you so much for all this great information, Dr. Christy Huff, cardiologist and director of the Benzodiazepine Information Coalition. Thanks for being on Modern Minds today. Thanks for having me.
Thank you to Dr. Christy Huff for chatting with me today. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, I'm going to bring us back to my conversation with Dr. Mark Horowitz. We've got much more with him. I'm Mark Hennick. This is Modern Minds. Mental health is health. At the Institute of Living, we are pioneers in mental health, and we have been for 200 years. We have an ambition to transform mental health services while co-designing these services with those whom we serve. Together, we can reduce stigma, address discrimination, and increase access to care. Welcome back to Modern Minds. I'm Mark Hennick. Here's the continuation of my chat with Dr. Mark Horowitz on deprescribing. Can you t maybe tell us a bit about some of the motivations that somebody might want to deprescribe and how they can go about having that conversation with their doctor? So the reasons why people uh, would like to stop medication in surveys and, and, and in patients that I've seen, the number one reason is people want um, uh, their emotions back. They feel that being on antidepressants causes numbing of their emotions. That is both negative and positive emotions are, are squashed. Uh, they're less intensity. Some people experience that effect of antidepressants as being uh, very uh, relieving in the short term. They often start medications you know, in the throes of panic or anxiety or depression. And to have the emotions uh, turned down from a, a nine to a three is experienced as a relief. In the long term, it has consequences for people because we don't have medications that are so brilliant. They just target negative thoughts. They target all emotions that we have. And so people lose uh, interest in life, excitement, it affects their relationships. Um, and so that's the number one reason pe people want to come off these medications. Other reasons are different side effects or adverse effects of these drugs, which range from impairment of memory, uh, uh, trouble with concentration, uh, tiredness during the day, sleep disturbance, weight gain, uh, sexual side effects. We know that at least half of people will have sexual side effects, uh, which include reduced libido, uh, reduced ability to ejaculate uh, or experience an orgasm. Uh, there are, uh, and then there are there are other other effects like nausea um, that people find disturbing, and and that's sometimes the reason people want to stop their medication. Other people are concerned about the long term health effects of the medication. So there are no long term trials of antidepressants compared to placebo, but there are studies that find that people on antidepressants, but who are not on antidepressants, have doubled the risk of cardiovascular disease, stroke, falls, uh, and even an early death. Now, I mean, given the most um, psychiatric medications, or, or at least antidepressants, I mean, more than half are prescribed by GPs. They're not even prescribed by by psychiatrists, so they might not. I, I assume they have you know good knowledge to prescribe that, hopefully, um, but maybe not as deep as as another specialist would. So, how does a patient talk to their doctor? Who, especially in psychiatry, you might get labeled as non-compliant uh, if you don't want to take your your medication. How do you have that conversation with your healthcare provider? So you're right, more than 80% of antidepressants are prescribed by, by GPs in, in Canada and America and other places in, around the world. Um, I, I would hope that most doctors wouldn't, wouldn't um, respond with you're being non-compliant. I think, I think there is general understanding that antidepressants may serve a purpose for people in the short term. So I think it's quite common for people to stop these medications. It's not some outrageous, uh, uh, you know, exception to the rule. I think that most, I, I, I would hope that most GPs and psychiatrists would, would be able to have uh, a conversation about the benefits and the harms and alternatives. So if a person wants to stop a medication, you know, they'd be talking about what the adverse effects that they're experiencing are that they don't like, uh, what benefits they think they're getting, if any, uh, and what alternatives they have pursued or, or what has changed in their life. So you know, if someone went through a terrible period in their life after the death of a family member, things are a lot better now, you know, their, their emotions are a lot calmer, uh, you know, it would be completely sensible to consider a, a reduction or stopping medication. What is the typical protocol 
uh, uh, for deprescribing and what should patients look out for in terms of how they uh, react to that process, assuming they move forward with it? So the most common way, so let's say you were to go to your, your doctor, ask to stop your antidepressant. We know the most common way that antidepressants are stopped is over four weeks. We've surveyed patients and we've also surveyed doctors. Um, and that is because that's what the guidelines have said for many years. Uh, in in America, the guidelines say to stop antidepressants over, over a few weeks, and they've said that for the last at least 10 years. Uh, similar in Canada, they said that for at least the last seven years. Uh, and so most doctors will probably do the following. They will halve the dose of the drug you're on for a couple of weeks and then halve it again for another couple of weeks and then tell you to stop it. So you may go down, say, from 20 milligrams of a drug uh, to 10, then to 5, and then to 0. Um, we know that causes quite a large proportion of people trouble with coming off, in particular causes withdrawal symptoms. Um, we know that people's brains become accustomed to the drugs over time. They, the drug, you, you adapt to the drug. Uh, that's what causes tolerance effects and what's often described as physical dependence, which is different from addiction. It's just the process of adaptation to the drug that happens with repeated use. For example, you know, it happens with caffeine. If we drink a cup of coffee every day, our brain becomes accustomed to it. And if we stop the drug, we experience withdrawal symptoms. And often people will experience withdrawal symptoms when they stop antidepressants very quickly over a few weeks. And those withdrawal symptoms can include both emotional symptoms and physical symptoms. And the emotional symptoms involve things like anxiety, depressed mood, trouble sleeping, panic attacks, crying spells, uh, sometimes feeling suicidal. As you can see from the list of psychological symptoms, anxiety, depressed mood, uh, it's very easy for people to mistake those symptoms for a return of their underlying condition. And what we know that both doctors and patients are prone to do that. And so a very common story will be, doctor says, come off these drugs over a few weeks, the patient turns up, I can't sleep, I feel terrible. And the doctor says, well, uh, you must have experienced a return of your condition. This shows you must need the medication. You better go back on it and you might even need to use it uh, you know, for the rest of your life. We now know that it's very common for people to experience withdrawal effects. We know that at least half of people will do so when they stop it. And because we know that those symptoms overlap with the symptoms of depression and anxiety, doctors and patients need to be very uh, careful that they're not experiencing withdrawal symptoms. And so if they do, rather than concluding they must need the medication, if people experience withdrawal symptoms on stopping, it really means they need to stop the drugs more slowly. And so mm -hmm. there's been quite, um, an innovation in, in, in how antidepressants are stopped in humans, which hasn't filtered out the rest of the world at them at, yet. And that involves really doing it three things when stopping medication. One, doing it at a rate that a patient can tolerate. So it's very hard to say there's a one size fits all. Everyone should come off over the over the this number of weeks or months. You have to adjust the rate to what someone can tolerate. That's in the guidelines now in England. The second thing is doing it gradually. And gradually means for long term users, that's people who've been on the drugs for more than a few months, coming off over months and sometimes more than a year and sometimes even a few years because it can take that long for people to readapt to less drug being about. Uh, and so we know that weeks of tapering is too quick for most long-term users. And the third aspect is coming down in what's been called a hyperbolic uh, pattern, which means going down by smaller and smaller amounts of the drug as you get to lower doses. And this, 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 this is required because uh, very small doses of antidepressants have very large effects on the brain. So rather than it being a straight line where doubling dose, what do I out? doubling dose doubles the effect on the brain, uh, we know that uh, these drugs have a hyperbolic shape in terms of effect on the brain. Very small doses have very large effects. And the, and the effects flatten out at higher doses. And in the meantime, what has happened is patients have worked out that doctors don't know well how to stop these drugs, and they've exited healthcare and ended up on online peer support sites to get advice on how to come off these drugs. Um, and so 
you know, for this sort of peculiar circumstance where people are getting more helpful advice on private Facebook songs uh, than from their doctors, there really needs to be uh, an, an upskilling and, and the increased education of, of doctors uh, in Canada and, and America. In the meantime, do you think, are, are there effective um, peer support groups or other sort of uh, support networks that people can rely on to deal with some of the, the effects of deprescribing? Normally, the advice I'd give is go and ask an informed doctor, and that is, that is always going to be the best port of call. It can be very hard to find such a doctor. And in the meantime, there are a variety of uh, peer support sites uh, that can be helpful to people there on, you know, People uh, have these groups on Facebook. There are groups like Reviving the Antidepressants and the Withdrawal Project online. Uh, and all of these places can be useful sources of, of education which people can bring to their doctors uh, in order to educate their doctors uh, in order to get support about how to block these processes. Dr. Mark Horowitz, thank you so much for coming on Modern Minds and talking with me about this uh, controversial, but I think uh, very important topic. Thank you again. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Mark. Thank you so much to Dr. Mark Horowitz and Dr. Christy Huff for joining me on this episode of Modern Minds. Whether you're a patient or a provider of mental health care, I hope that we gave you lots to think about on the important topic of deprescribing. I'd like to ask you to share this episode with anyone you think might benefit from it. And if some quotes or clips stand out to you, tag me and let me know on social media. I'm at Mark Hennick, that's at M-A-R-K-H-E-N-I-C-K, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. We've also got lots more thought-provoking episodes just like this one to come. Uh, we have topics like electroconvulsive therapy uh, and more on the chemical imbalance hypothesis that you heard uh, a bit about from Mark Horowitz today. In the meantime, please go back and check out some of the other conversations that we've had so far. We've talked about recovery, architecture, teen mental health, psychedelics, and we've got plenty more to come. Every single episode is available in both audio and video on Spotify and YouTube, so go to the show on either of those platforms to get notified as soon as the next one is up. And we also have audio-only episodes on all of the usual podcast platforms. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon, uh, Audible, iHeartRadio, so many others. If you've got ideas for future topics or guests, get in touch with me on my social channels at Mark Hennick or on my website, markhennick.com, and send me a message there. I look forward to hearing from you and to talking with you again next time. Until then, I'm Mark Hennick, and this has been Modern Minds. Modern Minds.